what I want to talk about, first I want to set the stage, and I have a PowerPoint and a website to show you. But I want to set the stage, I think it's important for, uh, if you are a teacher here, uh, to understand that um, most teachers, I think, in this country, uh, they have worked in the field, and then they uh, move up into administration into jobs like Jorge. That's not common in the United States necessarily, but that is my experience. I started out working for General Motors doing hourly labor and went back to a community college, which is equivalent to your vocational education and training. And there, as I was going to school and working at General Motors, my job changed to the point that I um, was offered a job at the community college as a teacher. And then I moved through that process to an administrator to build a new plant for a new school to support General Motors as they were building two new plants in my hometown, Lansing, Michigan. And then from there, um, Toyota came up to Lansing and said, Annette, would you come to Kentucky and lead a vision for a national center of excellence in automotive manufacturing? And so I went to Kentucky and I spent six years building this national center that supported Asian, European, and American auto companies throughout the United States. And in 2011, that center was recognized by the National Governors Association as a best practice. And I was doing that work when Minnesota found me and said, Annette, would you be interested to come to Minnesota and be a president of South Central College? And that was a good fit for me because South Central College um, opened in 1946 as the vo first vocational technical school in the state of Minnesota. And so I'm going to talk about the national context first of what's going on in the United States. Then I'll bring that down to the state of Minnesota and then what is going on at South Central College in Minnesota. So shortly after I arrived at South Central College, um, I had no idea. I received a phone call in my office, and it was the Secretary of Commerce for the United States. And she asked me, Annette, please serve on President Obama's Committee for Advanced Manufacturing. That's something you just don't say no. So I went to Washington, and I served on this committee. Um, and it was really unique because there were major corporations there. There were major universities. And... Annette Parker, and I had no idea this would ever happen in my life. But um, I had a great experience there, and I positioned the state of Minnesota to provide some leadership nationally with this work. Uh, it led to a $15 million grant in advanced manufacturing that supported the entire state, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. After I served on President Obama's committee, I then uh, went to the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and I served on a national committee that focuses on building America's skilled technical workforce. So as AI and augmented technology becomes into place, how will we remain competitive? And so we had major researchers looking at that work, and that work is... Um, is published in the, in the manuals that you see here on the right side of the screen, Building America's Skilled Technical Workforce, and, uh, and the second book that focuses on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, when I served on um, uh, President Obama's committee, the, uh, oops, it's going there. When I served on President Obama's committee, there were two chairs of the committee, one education, one business. The business chair was, Ralph, um, was Andrew Liverest, who is the CEO of Dow Chemical, and the, um, the, the education chair was Raphael Reef, who is the president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now, MIT is one of the leading technology universities in the United States and really in the world. Um, and it was an honor to serve on that committee. But uh, Dr. Reef had a vision to create a um, committee using all of MIT's colleges 
to focus on what would the work of the future look like. And I want to say that it was very important that it didn't say the future of work because there is a future for work. But what is the work of the future? Okay? And so there's some major researchers working on this, and they're looking at how America will prepare for the technologies of the future. And we're looking to release our findings before the next U.S. presidential election. And so I would first like to go to the leadership link. And as we're waiting for that to come up, if you just go to the work of the future, MIT, on the web, if you Google that, it will come up. And I wanted to show you this website because it's very important. There's some resource, resources there that are available to anyone. And really what they're looking at is not just what engineers will need for the future, but what will the technicians, what will people in vocational and education and training need to do to be competitive in the future. And so it's really exciting research there, as well as um, leadership. I do serve on that advisory committee. There are two community college presidents, again, that serve there because they really want to hear from us about what we need to go forward um, as they do that research. We can go back to the PowerPoint if that's okay. It's okay that we don't go to that link. Oh, there we go. There's the leadership. Um, it, and let's just scroll down a little bit. It's really impressive when you see the researchers from MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, Harvard, that are all working on that research. And then uh, this is the group of advisors, and gosh almighty, Annette Parker, I would have never dreamed. Um, is also um, one of the um, people that's providing some leadership for that. And so I just wanted you to see that because that is, and you can see the website is workofthefuture.mit.edu. Um, the research page is probably more interesting because they're studying what's going on nationally. I mean, I'm sorry, internationally. So we can go back to the PowerPoint. There are former governors there, former um, the uh, majority whip for the uh, United States um, Congress. Um, William Ford is on there, the CEO of IBM, uh, major corporations. So there you can see in the research that the research is there. Uh, if you want to study advanced manufacturing, there's five pages of research so far published. Um, all of this is open to uh, the world, really. Okay, I'm ready for the PowerPoint. You guys must be awake. You're laughing. I'm getting them ready for you. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about promising practices in community colleges in the United States. Um, these are buzzwords. These are things that everybody's working on in community colleges around the United States. We're working on what we call career and guided pathways because American students can come in and, you know, I talked the first year I came here in 2014 about Americans just want to be free, so they don't really sometimes have a plan and they come into a community college and stay forever and really don't have an understanding of where they, what they want to do and how to get out. So we have career and guided pathways to help them really understand how do you get out and what is your path? Um, what courses should you take so that in two years you have a college degree and you can go on? Um, we have standardized core curriculum. So in American community colleges, you know, you're going to study mechatronics, for example, but you're also going to take some history and you're going to take some math and you're going to take some science and what is that and how do you standardize it so that everyone has the same experience. What's big in the United States is industry recognized credentials. So we have associations like the Manufacturing Institute, 
that make sure that, that, that all the big companies are members of, and they say, this is the skills we need for a, a machinist or for a mechatronics technician. And you take these credentials, you have to take a test to make sure that you're ready and you pass and get a credential in your card along with your degree that says, I have these competencies. Um, another big issue in the United States is credit for prior learning. So we have people that maybe didn't get a formal education. They learned on the job. Why would you make them take those courses over again? Maybe they can test out. Allow them to get credit for prior learning and get into the workforce. And so that's a big deal, especially for our veterans that are returning from the armed services that have all kinds of credit from learning in the military. And I'll show you a little bit about that and what we're doing in Minnesota relative to our veterans uh, in, in a few moments. Work-based learning and apprenticeships. I think our colleague Craig from the World Federation talked about that. Sometimes in the United States, we like to recreate things because we've been doing apprenticeships for a long time, but now it's new, okay? Um, and so we're looking at apprenticeships again and really looking at uh, what the um, uh, Germany and the Europeans are doing with apprenticeships. It's very impressive and we've learned a lot from you all. Um, we are also using innovative learning platforms. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, live online and that's something we're doing at South Central College where we're porting out classes into businesses all through the state of Minnesota, live and online. And non-credit to credit pathways. I wanna talk a little bit about that because in the American Community College, we're what you call a three-legged stool. We do three things, okay? We don't just have young people come in and exit. That's one pathway. That's one of the three stool, legs to the stool. It's students that come in that are 18 years old and want a college degree. But the other thing we do in, in, in career and tech ed or vocational education and training, then we have what you call transfer curriculum for the liberal arts and sciences. People that want to do two years in the community college and go to the university. Okay? And then we do continuing education and corporate training. So all the businesses in my community, I send people in to train their employees. Okay? And then the last thing I want to talk about is an effort in the United States called Achieving the Dream. Achieving the Dream is an organization of community colleges that focus on student success through evidence-based practices. So you can't just say, we're working to make sure every student succeeds. What is your evidence and how are you measuring success? And I'm proud to say that South Central College is an Achieving the Dream school. So let's take it down to the state level. This is the state of Minnesota. The circle shows you Minneapolis-St. Paul, our metropolitan area, which is the largest area. We have about eight schools within that circle. It's just blown up so that you can see it. Minnesota State Colleges and Universities is 37 colleges and universities with 54 campuses. We have seven universities and 30 colleges. I always say 24 because some of them have two, um, one president has two colleges. There's 30 colleges total and seven universities. Uh, we impact 47 communities throughout Minnesota. It's designed so that every Minnesotan has access to one of our schools. Okay? We serve about 396,000 students a year. 260,000 of them are credit-based. They're going to, they're either taking vocational education and training or university transfer. 136,000 of them are people in businesses 
that we go out and do co contracted or continuing education with. 50,000 of our students are what we call first generation. They're the first person in their family to ever go to college. And 10,500 are returning veterans from the military. All of us lead, uh, we have a chancellor that leads the entire state, and then there's 30 presidents, and we set the agenda for the state. And actually, I should be in a meeting with them right now, but I'm in a better place. Okay? So what it, Minnesota State, we have formed centers of excellence to help um, all of the colleges and universities focus on the major areas of our economy in Minnesota. Agriculture is big in Minnesota. We're the turkey capital of the United States. Uh, we have the largest soy cruncher, soybean, in North America, in the continent, in my town. Uh, beef, chicken, um, corn, um, alternative energy. Our energy firm is going to be uh, carbon free by 2030. Excel Energy, uh, engineering, healthcare. The Mayo Clinic is located in Minnesota and in my community. Um, we're the largest medical device manufacturer, uh, information technology, manufacturing, and transportation. Um, at my college, we host the Southern Minnesota Center of Agriculture, and we support all of the schools in agriculture in Southern Minnesota. Uh, the value of them is engaging our industry partners, putting students and making sure the programs are up to par, um, creating a pipeline to the college, so working with the high schools to make sure that kids understand the options that they can take in the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities and leading innovation in higher education. We learned that from our Bass colleagues. So let's talk about South Central College. Um, we're a part of the Minnesota State. We ha I have two campuses that are about 50 miles apart. I don't know what that is in kilometers. Um, my economic impact that I have in my communities, in those two cities, and throughout southern Minnesota is about $161 million. We want the communities to know what is the impact of having a Minnesota State College or University in your community. It's $161 million annually. And we support or sustain about 1,410 jobs. South Central College's mission is to provide accessible higher education that promotes student growth and regional economic development. So everything we do is focused around that mission. I talked about the three stools we have, Associates of Arts and the Minnesota Transfer Pathway. Those are the students that want to transfer to our universities. Uh, South Central College has Minnesota State University Mankato across the river. Uh, we have the highest transfer rate to that university. Our mechatronic students, our, all of our manufacturing students transfer to manufacturing engineering over there. And we have the highest success rate of anyone that goes to Minnesota State University Mankato. Then we focus on our vet, technical career and professional, nursing, um, um, mechatronics, machining, welding, IT, all of the technical vocational things, and then workforce development, which works with the employee, employers. And I'll talk a little bit more about workforce development because it's actually bigger at South Central College than anything else that we do. You can see on the, on the technical side, and we serve about 5,000 students a year. In the United States, those kids are, I call them kids because I'm older, are 29 years old. 
Because what happens in the United States is, unfortunately, very similar problems to you have. People think vocational technical education is second class. So they go off to the university, and it doesn't work out for them. And then they come back to us because they want a job. OK? So you know they've worked at McDonald's for a little while, and then they figure out they better go back to school. And they come to the community college. And it's open to every American to come back at any time, whether they're 18, or if you want to start early in high school at 16, or if you're 50 and you need to change your career. Okay? 49% of our students come full time. They're there all day. But others have jobs, and because they're 29 years old, they have families, wives, and children. Okay? And so we need to figure out how we help them be successful as well. These are the national partnerships that South Central College works with. Um, because we get state dollars, the way we're funded in Minnesota is part of it comes from grants. And, um, well, the biggest part comes from the state appropriation, our percentage of what comes to our college from the state. The other is tuition in, in the United States. I'm sure you all have heard about the debt, the tuition debt that Americans have for going to school. But then it's generally not enough, and I have to be a fundraiser. So I go out to businesses, and I ask for money successfully, okay? Um, but I also look for other organizations and institutions that can help us. So the National Science Foundation in D.C., the Advanced Technological Education helps all our VET programs, okay? The U.S. Department of Labor, uh, and these are just different fundings underneath them. Achieving the dream helps me help students be more successful. And guess what? I get paid by the number of students that are successful. Okay? Uh, the U.S. Department of Corrections, uh, we have a program with them called the Second Chance Pell. So we actually have programs at the correctional facility, at the prison, you might have heard. It, it might be more familiar. Uh, to help students get the training that they need, low-level offenders, so that when they get out, they can get a good job and maybe not be a repeat offender. The American Association of Community Colleges. Thank you, Wayne. Um, uh, we, um, the Aspen Institute. Um, the D U.S. Department of Education, the Joyce Foundation, and the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning. And I'll talk a little bit about those. So, but first I want to give you a sense of a couple of our programs that I'm very proud of. And so the guys in the back are going to pick on the machine tool technology um, picture and kind of start a YouTube to show a little bit about what we do with our program in Machine Tool at South Central College. So the ball course started with uh, MSU students, the senior design students, two years ago. And we did a concept design with them and then we prototyped the first iteration of this ball course. And then it went up to the South Central students in the computer, computer integrated machining department for them to really look at the material use, the play experience, and really come up with this beautiful, machined, really robust uh, design so that children could play with it on the floor and it not break down. Um, so we're really excited about having this here. We're proud of the students and look forward to more partnerships with both MSU and South Central College. My name is Stacy Thrond. I'm a second year student at SEC for the Computer Integrated Machining Program. And we built this um, marble maze here for the kids at the Children's Museum. Uh, each student was given a specific, specific component, and we all had to work together to make all those components come together so that it was kid-proof and uh, bulletproof. And uh, it's been a really, really rewarding experience, especially now seeing the kids um, play with it and, and follow the ball around. And hopefully it's here to last a long time. I worked on this part here. We used um, brass and 3D printed parts 
There's also a lot of aluminum, and there's some stainless steel also. And every part in here we machined um, at school on our machines, and uh, we just learned a ton doing all this stuff. A lot of brainstorming, and um, it's really rewarding to go from a concept to a finished product. It's, it's really a neat process. So we can just go on to the next video, um, and that will highlight our mechatronics program. So the three programs that we offer really that are manufacturing focus at South Central is uh, welding, uh, machine tool, and mechatronics. Um, we offer about 50 different degree programs, but, um, but I was asked to really focus on the manufacturing here um, today. So um, I don't have a video for welding, but um, th uh, all of these students get national certifications, and I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is a model that we set up for industry-recognized credentials with guided, a guided pathway so that when people come into our building, they know how to work their way through a program, and it leads to them multiple entry and exit points. So if they just want a certain level of certification, so I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit. If you're a machinist and you just need to understand milling, you can get that certification and leave out. If you already know milling and you want the full degree, you can take the test, the industry test, and come in and take lathe and the other stuff and, and leave. But you can come in from the beginning and go all the way to the university. Uh, and that just shows you what it looks like, uh, broke down again, but for sake of time, I'm gonna move on. Um, I've talked a lot about the industry stackable credentials. But it doesn't matter where you get your degree because across the United States, they're, we're, it's a national certification. So it's recognized beyond uh, Minnesota. So if you don't, you've never heard of South Central College, uh, you can show that industry has proven your certification and it doesn't matter if you end up in Maryland like my cousin here, okay? Um, the American National Standards Institute certifies a lot of the certifications. I know in, in, in Europe, it's ISO is the equivalent. Um, so they're nationally certified in ICE as well. These are some of the organizations. And just to give you a quick look at it, um, the, the red box is the National Institute of Metalworking Skills. That's for machining. The AWS in the middle, the white box, the, the triangle-like, 
Uh, that's the American Welding Society, and it goes on and on. And that's how you stay current. Um, so we started on this credentialing path initially um, with the work that was going on, and then we had a great opportunity through the American Association of Community Colleges to take it further, take it deep into the college through um, an opp uh, opportunity we had called the Right Signals Initiative that was led by the American Association of Community Colleges and funded by the Illumina Foundation, a foundation in Indianapolis uh, that gave the AACC the money to do this work. And so then we were able to go further and, and involve HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, auto body and collision, and now it's just a culture at South Central College that you align to industry standards, uh, you make sure there's an industry test at the end so that the students know that their training is relevant, is portable, is stackable. So um, I'm almost done here. I get five minutes because my stuff didn't work. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, another thing I want to talk about is our chancellor, my boss, started an initiative. Um, a good friend of us, Stephen Rosenstone, started uh, charting the future for a prosperous Minnesota. And it was our strategic plan. And as part of that, it was an operation called, um, we, I took on the credit for prior learning and led the state in that. And it's, I talked about it earlier. It's how you recognize credit that somebody may not have learned in the school, but they know it. How do you give them credit for that and let them move on? College credit. And so I led all 37 institutions over a three-year period where they all had to do this work. So every Minnesota State College and University now is doing this work uh, to make sure that students can get credit for what they know. I'm going to show you a perfect example of that. I'm going to move on. We set up three work groups um, of faculty that really believed in this, teachers that believed in this, that could go out and help the other colleges understand what it took, and that we really weren't just giving people something. We were proving that they knew what they were getting. So uh, there's benefits to it. I don't want to spend much time on that. Uh, I think my PowerPoint will be available if anybody is interested afterwards. Uh, we did a lot of research and planning around this work, faculty engagement and administrative support. This is the one I want to talk about because this is how it started. Credit for prior learning for service members. So you can't see it very well. I want to point to it. It's up... Uh, uh, the image up here, that's a website that every veteran in the United States can go to. They enter their branch of the military, their um, rank, and it comes down with a list that shows all the credit they would get at every Minnesota State College or University based on their military experience. So the first one, uh, at Northwest Technical College, if you wanted to get a degree in business, a certification rather, you would get 20 credits, okay? This person was in the Army. Um, his occupation was a 36B financial management technician. He uh, listed in the military October 2009, is currently enlisted. And his rank and skill is E1 e, e through E4 at a level 10. So he gets 20 college credits. Does not pay for that. Okay? At first, South Central College didn't do this. But by setting up this website, you know how I got my college to do it? I showed them the website. And they saw all the colleges that was doing it, and they weren't. Oh, geez. In a week, we were doing it. Okay, then we focus on work-based learning opportunities. Every student at South Central College is in a vocational, technical, or professional, has to do an internship, but we also offer apprenticeship. Whoops, I turned it off. There, I turned it back on. 
Um, this is just a little bit about the benefits of apprenticeship. Uh, you heard the guy, Craig, from the World Federation talk about Americans getting more and more into this. In the state of Minnesota, every employer now gets a tax benefit if they take in an apprenticeship, apprentice, and they get one per apprentice. So this is really growing in Minnesota. Um, and uh, there's just some benefits. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but these are two case stories, uh, case studies from two of our students that uh, just recently completed their apprenticeships. And this is our machine tool faculty and uh, some of their apprentices. It talks about their benefits. Uh, students complete, they, they stay and they complete because in the United States, once you start getting certifications, you can get a job and leave. We want them to complete and this helps with completion. It strengthens partnerships with our industry. Um, students share on the job knowledge in the classroom. Um, you guys know this in, in Europe and in other nations. Um, it provides related instruction. It supports the students throughout their program. Uh, you can communicate progress to students and employers. And, and we assist the employers with the uh, the state grant for tax uh, relief. So um, this is really how we recruit it, and um, uh, that's one of our students that just recently graduated last month. Uh, he's at Sage Glass, which if anybody's here from France, that's Saint Gobain, um, uh, and uh, they're making uh, electrochromatic glass. Um, and uh, another initiative we're doing is called Minnesota Reconnect. So everybody, uh, the, Craig talked about uh, the demographic shifts and the issues around not having enough workers. In Minnesota, the unemployment rate is 2.4%. That's non-existent. And the employers are after me all the time because they there's not enough people for the jobs that we have. And so, uh, but there's 800,000 people in the state of Minnesota with some college that dropped out and never, they just went away. And so we started what you call Minnesota Reconnect and South Central College is one of the four pilots. I can't say we're a pilot anymore because the legislature just finished the end of May and gave us another $2 million to do this work to recruit people that stopped out of college. We pay them to come back. We give them all kinds of supports to complete a degree, plus credit for prior learning. Yes, okay, I'm wrapping it up. One last thing that's important because in, when we come to other countries, we talk very much about the fact that we do all of these programs for young people that they're getting their first college experience. But it's important to know that the third stool in a community college is customized training, going into an employer, helping them identify what their issues are, and then training their staff to address those issues. And South Central College does a lot of that. We train over 13,000 people a year uh, it, doing that, just working with employers. Um, that is, the state does not give us money to do that. It's a revenue generating operation. So we charge and it has to pay for itself to do that work. Um, and we do that through telepresence sometimes. That's just one of the ways we do it. Um, I had to show that one. That's one of our, uh, our commencement, one of our future students. And then another student, you can see they're 29 years old, they're married, they have children. So I wanna leave by talking about what exceptional education is. I told uh, Jorge I would do that and I wanna thank him because this image here is some of our students that were just here in March to have a culinary education experience with their culinary programs here in the Basque country, and it was amazing. I've eaten so much Basque food since they got back. It's just been amazing. 
Um, but exceptional education is really all about partnership, collaboration, and it has to be public and it has to be private. You have to include your community, your employers, um, international partners, national partners, and across the states. And we can all learn from each other. You heard tidbits of what we've learned from the Basque country. Um, I hope there's things that they've learned from us. But together, education is a common theme and is something we can all do to make the world a better place. And that's what exceptional education means to me. So thank you, and thank you for your time.